it's recorded. All right, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things really quickly. For Thursday, I would like you, uh, I've got three articles that I would like you to read for Thursday. So if you go, at, and the way that it's structured, if you go to the Dropbox, and within the Dropbox, there's a folder called New Humanists. And within that folder, so you're in the New Humanist folder within the Dropbox, and within that folder, there are three articles that I'd like you to read. One is called The Humanism of Irving Babbitt. So Humanism of Irving Babbitt. The second one is called PEM, Revival of Humanism. That's Paul Elmer Moore, Revival of Humanism. And then the last one is Alan Tate, just Tate, T-A-T-E, Fallacy of Humanism. Right, so Humanism of Irving Babbitt, Revival of Humanism, and Fallacy of Humanism. All right, everybody have those? And then, so for next week, I'll give you, um, yeah, I'll, well, do you guys want to know for next week? So just go ahead and, yeah, I'd like you to read, uh, yeah, I'll just give them all to you now. There are four articles within the Christopher Dawson folder by Christopher Dawson, and I'd like you to read those. They all start off with CD for Christopher Dawson. Okay, that's for Tuesday of next week. And I, I would like you to start, I don't know if we'll use it every time, but I would like you to start bringing your T.S. Eliot book. Because I know Deidre started with that last week and we're going to pick that back up. So, all right, everybody clear on all that? Okay, good. Thanks, everyone. All right, so again, very glad we're all here. And I want to continue with where Deidre was talking last week, and that is looking at what happened. Yes? Could you explain what we're supposed to give you this Thursday real quick? Oh, sure. So uh, on Thursday, well, actually, it's, uh, I don't need it until Friday. You can send it to me as long as I get it Friday by midnight. So uh, meaning Friday to Saturday, right? Not mm -hmm. Friday, not Thursday to Friday. Uh, all I need is just a, like a, a formal email to me that basically says, this is what you're writing on. Here's what you found. So just kind of describe, here are some of the questions I'm going to ask. I'm not expecting any of you to have your answers yet uh, at all. But here's the topic. Here's what I'm hoping to look at. Here are the sources I found. Basically, <coughs> that's it. So it doesn't need to be a paper, just kind of a nice email right, to me. So, okay. but you know, probably uh, 150 to 200 words would be good. So, everybody, is that good for everybody? Okay, good. Thank you. Do the yeah. sources need to be formatted? No, 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 I'm not going to grade for Turadian or anything. Uh, no, no, this is, not, this is not a graded paper. This is basically me really making sure that you guys have a topic, and if there are things that I can add to it, I'll respond and say, why don't you look here or here. So we're just going to have a, a good republic of letters going on. All right, good. Not here. So basically, do we need to have an attachment to this email? Which can't just be in the no, just an email. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. I don't need attachments or anything. Okay. Yeah, just uh, just type it out and get it to me by midnight okay. on Friday. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. All right. So last week, Deidre was talking about, and I was before that, the nature of modernity and what happens in modernity. And I, I want to just I want to be as blunt as possible about what modernity is. If you remember, I read, and I know it's been two weeks now, but I had read from Romano Guardini. And Guardini had talked about, I think in the best sense, that modernity is this attempt to compartmentalize knowledge and then in the various compartments figure out what the truth is. But often not unifying those compartments or unifying them in such a way that they become obscure in our attempt to understand. So when we're in the middle of it, we understand exactly what's going on. And that's why I had Deidre on Thursday give you those five points of communism. If you've got those five points of Marxism, which are very complicated and very interesting, but once you have those, you have everything. That's really all you need to know. And that, that's a perfect example of modernity this idea that we can get into these compartments and we dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And when we do, we figure out what that knowledge is. The problem, of course, is that we're isolating that knowledge from all kinds of other knowledge and we're privileging it. And one of the reactions to this 
And I think of um, someone in the 20th century who would not be a Christian humanist, but certainly an ally, someone like Friedrich Hayek, who recognized that it is very necessary that we acknowledge humility when we're trying to figure out what we do and what we don't know. There has to be mystery in life. And it's not mystery necessarily in the way that, you know, for those of us who might be Eastern Orthodox, we celebrate mystery as the ultimate expression of faith. That's totally fine. But the mystery that Hayek is talking about, though related, is more the mystery of just humility. We don't know what this is. All mystery presumes humility on our part. But this is a mystery and an acknowledgement that we simply can't know all things. And even if we added up the sum of all that humanity knows, which is what the great figures of the 18th century, the encyclopedias, tried to do, we can't get there. Even if we have knowledge built upon knowledge, we still have to recognize that there are things that hold one bit of knowledge to another, and then there's going to be missing knowledge, and we're going to have links between things that don't always fit. So the problem with modernity is, number one, it compartmentalizes knowledge. But number two, in its effort, which may be well-intentioned, but in its effort to understand the world, it explodes its own ideas to madness, as C.S. Lewis said. So with communism, obviously we should love community. This is part of human nature, that we love our communities. But if we only love our communities, we're creating a grave error. We're looking at one truth and considering everything else to be false, as opposed to understanding that there are millions upon millions of truths, many of which we'll never know, but we accept exist somewhere in reality. So we have to be very careful about that. And that's why I wanted to talk about these figures in particular in terms of trying to understand where modernity comes from and what happens. So when we leave the 18th century, we have someone like Thomas Jefferson writing in the Declaration or later in 1801 in his first inaugural. He's really that last great gasp of what we might call a classical liberalism or a republicanism. Not modern liberalism at all, but a kind of classical, pre-modern understanding where what does Thomas Jefferson say in both the inaugural as well as in the Declaration? We know that this is a unique individual endowed with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Beyond that, we don't define it. We have a basic starting fact, and that fact, which is a faith, is the belief that every individual matters. And from there, we allow it to proceed. We don't try and define what that individual is beyond that minimal agreement, and we don't try and assert that the individual must go this direction or this direction. We allow nature to take its course, and we attempt to leaven the human being, but the human being has to do this on his or her own as well. What we find with modernity is that there's so much attention given to a primal cause, not a first cause necessarily, but a primal cause, that we lose sight of all kinds of things. So just to go down the list here, we'll forget Nietzsche for a moment, but we think about Darwin, where everything is biological and adaptive in the way that we respond to the environment. We see environmental conditions, we either succeed in combating it or we die. And we therefore don't continue on in the gene pool. With Marx, we have this definition of strict materialism, this idea of economic determinism for all persons, that we are governed by the way that we respond to certain economic conditions and those conditions in a very progressive form of history will keep moving inalterably towards this utopia, this socialist or communist utopia, and there's this progressive element in it. Lenin will take that farther, and Lenin will actually start creating revolutionary ways of moving progress faster than it had been moving before. So Lenin, if you think about what my wife talked about on Thursday, we take it a step further, Marx gives us the five steps, the five things you have to know for history. But Lenin actually adds the possibility that we as persons either stand with history or we stand against history. If we stand against history, we're going to die. There's no question about that. History will crush us. 
but only at the expense of history slowing down just a little bit. And this is why Lenin is publishing articles in 1900, 1901, 1902, during a great famine in Russia, where he tells people, don't be charitable. The worst thing you could do is help out a farmer in crisis right now. Because by helping out that farmer, you're perpetuating the present system. It is better to allow the anger of the farmer to increase to the point of revolution. So if you try and help, you are standing in front of history. And you're going to lose, but you'll lose by slowing down the engine of progress, too. So nobody wins out of that for Lenin. So it's better to let the poor die so that we get this revolutionary fervor up in which we can change the very consciousness of man to move us towards revolution. That's what he's going for. That's his main goal. So Lenin, Marx is already radical, but Lenin radicalizes Marx even further. And that's where the whole idea in the 20th century comes from, from revolutionary consciousness. So you guys are all way too young for this. But I'm just the right age, being born in 1967. Uh, my, my teachers I had in grade school were deeply influenced by this idea, whether they knew it or not, this idea that we have to change consciousness, our awareness. So if any of you have ever been to a really, and I recommend going just to see what it's like, if you've ever been to a really hardcore ideological meeting, whether it's by labor union organizers or feminists or by Marxists, you always have this same kind of idea. It's this revolutionary consciousness, this change of attitude. And this is what they want so that we can propel history forward. And it gets really, it can get really, really dark because you've got to change this way of thinking. And therefore, you can do all kinds of things in the name of revolution that normally we would consider absolutely heinous. But because they move us towards revolution, they're acceptable. So, for example, in the 1960s, and because I have to forgive me, this is really, really nasty, really R-rated, but there was a book by a guy named Eldridge Cleaver, who was an incredible radical among black power, and his argument was, it is absolutely necessary for white women to be raped in order for them to understand revolutionary consciousness. That's a part of his book, Soul on Ice. Right? This, this incredible understanding of making terrible things happen. And it's what we see with, for example, Antifa and the kinds of arguments that it makes. It's promoting violence, but they don't consider themselves violent because it's for the cause of revolution and consciousness awareness. So it's an excuse, but they believe it. That's the scary part. It's an excuse to be able to do these horrific things uh, in order to allow society to move forward. With Freud, Freud's not nearly that radical. Freud, as the great psychologist of, or psychiatrist, depending on how we want to define it, of the late 19th century, we often think of him as a 20th century figure, but that's because all of his books were published in English. They were translated and published in English in 1901 and 1902, but they had all been written in the 1880s and 90s. He's very much a 19th century figure, even though we Americans don't come to him until later. But in his own writings, he has this very complex argument, and in many ways it's based on a liberal arts understanding of the human mind. He is liberally educated and he's a fascinating guy. But he becomes obsessed with the notion that we as human beings make one really grand decision. And it's a decision that we make when we're barely conscious of it. It's a decision we make when we as either male or female, and this, this is not politically correct in today's day and age at all. Uh, this is back before we have any of the kind of lesbian, gay, any of that going on. Because what Freud says is that ultimately, as a male, the only way I will be ever healthy is if at, say, age two, I see my mother and I recognize her as different from me. And the same thing for a girl. A girl has to see her father and recognize for the first time he is different from her. And that this whole identity with our sexuality at age two or three is what defines everything from that point forward. So if we mess up, 
if, for example, I see my mother and I don't quite understand that she's different from me, I will never have a healthy personality, ever, for the rest of my life. I will be messed up in some way. And it's not until we go through psychoanalysis and regression that we can figure out, oh, at age two, you made this wrong decision. And you can repair it. But that's what Freud is telling us. Now, obviously in 2020, this is something that nobody would teach anywhere because of the implications it has for homosexuality and really trying to name homosexuality as a perversion. But in Freud's day, you know, that, that was the essence of things. Uh, and you still, guys, it's amazing to look, and I give you this as an example, not as judgment, but one of my favorite books is a book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire. I don't know how many of you have read it. it. It's one of those books that's just, once you start it, you can't put it down. It's a comprehensive history of the rise of Nazism and to get into it and what's going on. But one of the, one of the things Shire says, and he's a liberal, he's a, a serious 1940s liberal, and he says right away, well, it's very clear that most of the Nazis were homosexuals. They were all perverts. Right? And, that, and it was just stated so bluntly. It was like, oh, okay. And that's that Freudian influence that's so strong throughout much of the 20th century. It will not change until the revolutionary consciousness of the 1960s changes it. And then suddenly Freud goes out of fashion uh, for obvious reasons. So they're very interesting. But again, let's imagine for a moment that Freud, even if he's correct, and I'm not saying he is, but... Really, is all of life determined by this one decision we make at age two? That seems absurd to me on the face of it, that whatever that decision is, that that would determine everything from that point forward until we recognize it and reverse it. But yeah, that's one of the strongest arguments that Freud is trying to make. Nietzsche, we've already talked about. Spencer, I want to mention just briefly, because he's a fascinating figure one of those figures that will probably not be remembered for m much longer, and it, it's amazing that anyone really remembers him up to this point, but he was so much a 19th century figure. He was so identified with the 19th century that it's really one of those, he's one of those people that once his time is done, he's done. So he's absolutely fascinating during his time period. But he tends to be so identified with it that there's once we know the time period, we know him. So even if you haven't heard of him and you don't know him, you do know him because you know him through popular literature. He's the model for Sherlock Holmes, and he's also the model for Captain Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So and there are, whenever you see Victorian images of Englishmen, they're quite often kind of caricatures of Herbert Spencer. He is kind of the ultimate Victorian in England. And he, he's an English social thinker. He dies in 1903. He, even his, his dates, right? born in 1820, dies in 1903. He's so much of a 19th century character. But here's his argument that he makes. He publishes what's often regarded as the first book of sociology in the English language. It's a book called Social Statics that he publishes in the first half of the 1850s. And his argument, which parallels Darwin's, is a biological economic argument, saying essentially that it is our duty not to be charitable to people. It is our incumbent duty upon us not to practice charity. And notice how similar it is to what Lenin was saying. But Spencer's coming from the opposite side. He's a hardcore, laissez-faire libertarian in much of what he argues. So he's quite different from Marx, but he still has a similar argument. And the reason is not because you want to make sure that you develop a revolutionary consciousness. The idea is that you want to prevent a revolutionary consciousness, and you want to weed people out of the gene pool who can contribute bad things. So the idea is, if you encounter a homeless person and they seem to be content with their lot in life, you just walk on. You let them die. You don't help them and you don't hurt them. You let nature take its course. And if nature has already decided, has selected this homeless man to die, 
so be it. We don't want that person in our population any longer. We don't want his ideas. We don't want his genetics. We don't want any of his biological material. None of it. You have to just let it go. So you neither herp, you neither help nor hurt the poor. So he writes, and he's brutal. He's absolutely brutal about this. Inconvenience, suffering, and death are the penalties attached to nature for ignorance, as well as to incompetence. They are also the means of remedying ignorance and incompetence. And whoso thinks he can mend matters by dissociating ignorance and its penalties lays claim to more than divine wisdom and then more to divine benevolence. By weeding out those of lowest development and partly by subjecting those who remain to the never-ceasing discipline of experience, Nature secures the growth of a race who shall both understand the conditions of existence and be able to act up to them. It is impossible in any degree to suspend this discipline by stepping in between ignorance and its consequences. So if you try to be charitable, all you're doing is perpetuating whatever evil is causing that homelessness. So by helping the homeless, you're either helping his madness or you're helping his alcoholism, whatever it may be, but you're perpetuating it. You're not allowing society to move beyond it. So as he says, and I'll I'll repeat that, it is impossible in any degree to suspend this discipline by stepping in between ignorance and its consequences without, to a corresponding degree, suspending progress. If it be ignorant, if to be ignorant were as safe as to be wise, no one would ever become wise. And all measures which tend to put ignorance upon a par with wisdom inevitably check the growth of wisdom. So this is a critical moment that we have to allow this development. Now, I mean, think about this for a moment. And I'm very guilty of this as a parent, uh, more so than my wife. But when the kids were doing stupid stuff, as long as they weren't on the edge of death, I let them do stupid stuff. You know, basically because they have to learn. And if they fall off the jungle gym and hurt themselves, they fall off the jungle gym and hurt themselves. That's one thing when you're talking about a six-year-old. That's another thing when you're talking about a 40-year-old in the gutter. Right? I mean, there are different things going on here. And what Spencer is saying is the way that we would parent a child is the way that we would deal with social problems as adults as well. So we want these people. It is to the benefit... And, and I joke about this stuff, too. I'll never forget uh, when the, you guys were, wouldn't even have been born yet. But right, so it's been like 94, 95, and you can look this up. And I'm sure you guys have seen these, these Darwin Awards that people get every year. These, I mean, they're funny. They're truly funny. They're brutal. But you know, people who do the stupidest stuff and die because of it. And I'll never forget, I was in grad school, and a guy took a jet engine and put it on top of his car. And, and ignited the jet engine. And of course, the car just disintegrated. And you know, he got the Darwin Award. You know, we're we're kind of glad he's not in the evolutionary pool any longer. But that, it, it, it's funny and terrible, but that's exactly what Spencer wants. He wants people who do stupid things to pay for that, uh, very much to pay for that. So we get rid of them as quickly as possible. So not just homeless, but people who climb things they shouldn't be climbing. And people who do stupid stuff like trying to paint in the corner with a ladder on top of you know their staircase and they fall and break their uh, Spencer's got okay with that. That's good, right? We want that kind of thing. Reagan. Yeah, I was wondering if these ideologies operate on a scale of familiarity. Like, um, it's one thing for like the stranger yeah. in the gutter doing those stupid things, but is there like an exception for? that person when it's like your spouse losing their job for being negligent or something? Or is it just yeah. across the board, like brutal for everyone? Yeah, my understanding, and I, I don't, I, I'd actually studied Spencer quite a bit when I was in college and I haven't much since then. My understanding is he was actually a really nice guy, personally. Uh, that his theories were really meant to be more at the abstract level. So when you see these people that you don't really know, you don't help, and you let this just kind of take its own course, but if they're relatives and others, you treat them in a different fashion. Um, and I, I think that he's pretty much, even though, now he is a radical individualist. I mean, really radical in, in the Nietzschean sense. He's that kind of individualist. Uh, not in what we would consider kind of a modern libertarian, but an extreme Darwinian individualist. So I, I think his, 
his charity definitely has limits, uh, and especially when applied to social policy. So he's, in this article or in this book I'm reading from right now, Social Statics, he's actually talking about, he's responding to Britain's idea of creating poor laws, I, uh, things where you would actually create homeless shelters or soup kitchens. And he's saying, no, you, we should not be doing that. And it's not merely because it's, I mean, I, I might make the same argument if, if it's the federal government doing it versus your grandfather doing it, right? I might make the same argument. It's better for, for Bud Veer to do it than it is for you know, the Department of, of Health and Human Services. But that Spencer is saying it's better not to do it at all. So Ed, it's yeah, go ahead. like an individualist influence take on localism where like the lack of charity gets like more severe larger yes. scale. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So charity in and of itself is pretty dangerous. Okay. And he's not he's not totally wrong. Right? I mean there there is no doubt that there are times we are probably paying alcoholics or yeah. drug addicts to do more, right? I mean, that, that's, that's clear, but he's so drastic about it, right? It's like, no, no, we want Thank those guys gone. So as quickly as possible, yeah. Thank you. I'll give you another example. This is, please, this is not me, but I, I will never forget one of my high school teachers who was really a good teacher overall, but I'll, it was the, the first cases of AIDS were coming out. And I, she told our class, I was a, a junior, in high school, and she told our class, it's ridiculous anyone's trying to solve this. We can finally get rid of the gays, right? <laughs> you know, can you, and that, that's a Darwinian. That's like, no, no, I mean, just let this run its course. So, yeah, it's brutal, absolutely brutal. And she was a really nice person, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, not on that. So, okay, Anybody, thank you, Reagan. Anybody else on this? So my point is, and, and Spencer had some really interesting things. If you guys ever take uh, Dr. Kaltoff's history of, of science and biology, he deals a lot with how Spencer fits in with evolutionary theory and what's going on in the 19th century. He's an important guy that way. But in terms of his politics and what he's doing here, I mean, it is purely, purely Darwinian. Okay, so if there aren't questions, I want to jump to the last thing before we get into the good guys, and then we're going to be on the good guys for the rest of the semester. Uh, guys that I like, I should say. So one of the ways that all of this plays out, and especially in the kind of Spencerian understanding, is a movement that occurs in America, and I'm always a little, in the last few years I've been a little uncomfortable teaching this, not because I don't believe it or believe in it, uh, and so it's not because of my own views, but simply because it's become such a political issue within the last decade, and that's the issue of immigration. So in America, we can never understand progressive theory without tying it to the question of immigration. And you know, all I have to do is look down the list of your names. And most of our families, interestingly enough, probably came about the same time. Uh, so my family, for example, my mom's side came in 1876 and my dad's in 1888. And you know, depending on what your last name is, if you're German, you're sometime in the 19th century. If you're Eastern European, you're almost certainly in the beginning of the 20th century. Less now is that, I assume it's Polish? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I bet anything's 1910. It's about the time. Yeah. That you're, yeah. I mean, you, you can judge these things uh, by what last names are and where they fit in. If you're Scandinavian, almost certainly you came in the 1840s. Uh, it's just in the Irish, almost all in the 1840s. If uh, you're Italian, you probably came between about 1900 and 1924. And that we just see this over and over again. This is who we are, waves of immigrants. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind, and I, I'm, I'm going to say this as objectively as possible, though I can imagine some people taking issue with it, but we know, uh, just historically, that America was the single most open country in the world for roughly about a century and a fifth of a century. So from about 1801 all the way up until 1921, any single person in the world regardless of sex, religion, or ethnicity, 
right? Race is not a factor here. You could be uh, a Jewish woman from Upper Botswana, which would be rare, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it does not matter who you are. You showed up on American soil as long as you did not have tuberculosis. You're now a permanent resident in America. That was the norm. Anybody who came. Now, there were exceptions to that. So in 1882, if I remember right, uh, Congress passed an exclusion on Chinese coming to America. But that's it. Between 1801 and 1921, there are no exclusions. And interestingly enough, even though there are huge exclusions put on in 1921 and 1924, it won't be until 1964 and 65 that there are any restrictions at all on anyone coming from any part of Latin America into the United States. So all those restrictions that were put on in 1921 and 24 only had to do with Europe and Asia. They had nothing to do with Latin America. So up until 1965, there was no such thing as an illegal from Mexico. It was a totally open border in terms of immigration between here and Mexico. And of course, we had that with Canada up until the Patriot Act of 2002. So we had an open border there as well, and that's only in your lifetime, right? Basically, you guys were about three when we closed the border to Canada. And it's still relatively open, but nothing like what it was. So my point here, I'm not trying to pass judgment. I, mean, I have my very, very strong views on this, but I'm not trying to pass much judgment in this classroom. I just want you to realize that the history of America has been more free borders than it hasn't been. And that even when I was growing up in the Reagan era, if you go back and look at Reagan, constantly Reagan was trying to take down immigration barriers. Let more people in. Let as many people in as you can. This is our safe haven. Somewhere, and I don't know exactly when, I think it was with 9-11, but somewhere between my childhood and today, conservatives became anti-immigration. But when I was a kid, it was the liberals who were anti-immigration. And the reason is because they didn't want competition for labor unions. So uh, it, it, it's just totally flip-flopped, and I'm still not used to it. It's still really weird to me when I hear a conservative be anti-immigrant. It is, my brain cannot adjust to that very easily. Uh, but again, my point is, you have to understand this is a fixture of America. What happens with progressivism and the development of progressivism and many of these ideas is that in the American context, they get caught up in whether or not we should allow foreign peoples into America. And foreign can mean a lot of different things. Foreign can mean that you're not from the British Isles, but you're still Protestant. Foreign could mean that you're Protestant, but not Catholic, or Catholic, but not Protestant. Right? There are, it's very interesting the way that these lines divide. And we typically, there was a time where no one in this country would have ever recognized me as a legitimate person in America because I'm German on both sides. That, that's foreign. That in 1840, that I would have been a foreigner, even if I lived in America. I would have been regarded as a foreigner. Now, of course, we do that mostly to Muslims and now to Hispanics as well. But that has shifted dramatically. It, a lot of it has to do with who's coming at that moment and who's not coming. Very few of us worry about the Italians anymore. Right? But there was a time when people were unbelievably upset about their property values going down because of the Sicilians that just moved in. Right? That, that was a big, big deal. And the idea that you could have these people in neighborhoods next to you was really worrying. Now, let me give you a context for this. So just think about this. In 1865, right at the end of the Civil War, there are 30 million Americans. But just contemplate that for a moment. 1865, that's 150 some years ago, there were 30 million Americans. I didn't look it up today, but we're at something like 330 million today. Right? That, in a century and a half, that is a huge jump. In other words, a century and a half ago, our population was 
actually a little less. It was about 8.5% of what it is today. So what changes is starting about 1866, 67, millions of people start coming into America. Sometimes a million a year are coming in. And if you were to go, for example, to New York, New York City, not upstate New York, but New York City in, well, let's just, let's just say 1905. If you were to go to New York City in 1905, four, well, let me get this right. It would be a little more than that. Let me do it out of 10. So out of every 10 people you met, four would not speak any English and six, now let me get that better. Six would not have English as a first language and four would not speak English at all. There, I got it. So that means that the majority of people you're talking to are almost the majority can't speak with you. Right? And that was the norm in New York. So you've just got all these people. So we go from 30 million people to a million people a year coming in for about the next 50 years. Right? <laughs> Those are serious changes. And I, I'm not, I would never defend bigotry and, and I've had a chance to go back and look at how people responded, and it's just the way it is, but how people responded to my mother's side when they came over in 1876. And in the newspaper articles, I'd be happy if you guys are interested, I'd love to show you this stuff. But in the newspaper articles, what is that smell? Oh, it is the Russian-German Frau walking down the street picking nits out of her hair. I mean, this, and what, we do, what do we do? We want this filth out of here as quickly as possible. Right, just article after, and that's the way almost every immigrant group has been treated, whoever they are. Um, so we see that time and time again, but it, again, it shifts. So we all get worried, and there's nothing bigoted about being worried that your culture might change. There's no bigotry in that. It's bigoted if you suddenly hate everybody else, and you want to shoot them and kill them and get rid of them through genocide. That's bigoted. But if you're just worried, wow, my neighborhood's really changing. What's going to happen to our parish church? Well, that, that's, those are normal human concerns. Those are understandable. But that's different from suddenly saying, you can't ever be an American. You're not an American in the way that it changes. And so this last person I've given you here was a very, and thank God he's not well known anymore. This guy deserves to be forgotten. But he was huge during the 19 aughts and the 19 teens, being very, very influential on both the Roosevelt administration, Teddy Roosevelt, and the Woodrow Wilson administration. And he wrote a book that, if any of you are interested in reading it, I mean, this would be an interesting topic. You'd probably be really, really depressed throughout the semester, but it would be worthy of a paper, certainly. Uh, a book called The Old World in the New. And it's the first real screed against the American tradition of immigration and trying to stop that immigration from coming into America. And what he does, and he considers himself a sociologist, and he's recognized by the American Sociology Association as one of the preeminent sociologists. He goes through and he breaks down in his book, and I have read it all, he breaks it down ethnic group by ethnic group. And what is it that we can expect from an ethnic group? So he breaks down, for example, and I'll just give you a, a quickly a few examples of these. Uh, the Danes and the Swedes. Right? What, well, basically, all Scandinavians are harmless. But they're so harmless, you really don't want them around. As he says, Scandinavians have no ability to imagine possibilities. They're just dull. They're like ox. And... Why would you want them? Now, interestingly enough, at the time he's writing this, there's a Norwegian woman who just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, right? Sigrid Unset. And of course, almost all of our own major mythology comes out of Iceland and of Scandinavia, but they don't have imagination. I mean, this is the guy who doesn't have imagination, <laughs> this guy writing this, right? Or how about this? Uh, this is, and I'll just quote Italians. For all the great majority of Italian immigrants, many are peaceable and industrious, and, but none of them can ever be matched by another ethnic group for their propensity for personal violence. The medievalism of Southern Italians appears from the fact that they commit more deeds of personal violence than gainful of any offenses. And he goes on to say, 
that you never play cards with a Sicilian because you'll find a knife in your back at the end of the game. And he's, he's being quite literal here. It's not symbolic. I has personal violence everywhere. How about this for Jews? None can beat the Jew at a bargain, for through all the intricacies of commerce, he can scent his profit. He is a peddler, a junk dealer, a broker, always on the first rung of the ladder. He is more capable of rising in a few years to become a manager, a banker, or a head of a department store than any other ethnicity. Moreover, almost all of our great clerks and salesmen and thousands of our contractors are Jews. We always must be careful because a Jewish businessman will much rather chase a Gentile girl than spare any time for an actual Jewess. Right? This is incredible. So, people, lock up your daughters. The Jews are coming. Right? <laughs> this is what he's saying. It's unbelievable. And then he sums all this up. What does this mean? So, he brings all these people together. And he concludes his book by saying, In this sense... It is fair to say now that the blood being injected into our veins is subcommon. To one accustomed to the aspect of a normal American population, these Caliban's, you guys all know who Caliban is, right? The demented genie from the Tempest, right? The, the, the creature, the monster. These Caliban's show up with frequency that is startling. Observe the immigrants when they come here, and what will you see? They are low-browed, big-faced persons of obviously low intelligence. I don't mean they're evil, but these are ox-like men who always stayed behind. Now, think about the illogic of that. These immigrants are bad because they stay behind. What are they doing on New York soil, then? It, it makes no sense at all what he means by this. Among women especially... Aside from that one fleeting moment of ephemeral bloom of girlhood, their beauty is always lacking. In every immigrant face, there's always something wrong. Something wrong with their lips, their mouth. Lips are always too long. Their cheekbones are always too high. Their chins are always poorly formed. And the bridge of their noses are hollowed. The bases of female immigrants have nose tilts. And they have horrible facial prognosis. There are so many sugar loaf heads, moon faces, slip mouths, lantern jaws, and goosebill noses among these women that one might decide that a malicious gen had amused himself by remaking human beings in the set of the image of a monster after God discarded them. There you go. Right? So this is the, the what's happening to America, right? And that ideal of think about this. The denigration of the human person is huge and tied up with this anti-immigration. Now, we can think of immigration in a lot of different ways, but there is no doubt that immigration, as it developed in America, and the laws against it, were deeply rooted in this progressive fear of evolutionary problems that will develop in the American character and in the American physiotype, that this will happen to us. And... I, I don't think he's right. <laughs> I think he's dead wrong in all kinds of ways. Shelby. Um, does he have a specific race that he prefers? Like, what does he think Americans are then? Yeah, he like, thinks... Against, like, every other race. Right. He, so America means specifically the original four white immigrant groups to America. Okay. So the Quakers, the Anglicans, the Puritans, and the Scotch-Irish. That's it. Right, that we have to remain white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in his, in his view. Yeah, and then also is he? And Lutherans don't count, by the way. Okay. Right, I mean, think that Lutherans are Catholic light, as they would have been seen then. <laughs> um, and then does he also is he mostly focused on like race, or is he mostly focused on like culture that these people stem from, or does he? It's not both. See a he doesn't see a difference. So a lot of his arguments are are truly that. Well, my gosh, if we marry these women with weird shaped noses that's just going to become a part of the American scene right we're going to lose that beauty but it's also as he said uh, and, and what I quoted it's brutal but we can say whenever we see these deformed peoples we also know that they are of low mentality 
And you know, one of the things that's interesting, and, and if you were to look, and gosh, I don't know how much you guys want to get into this. I'll just tell you this quickly. But everything we have from IQ tests to the SAT, they were all developed to weed out immigrant groups from succeeding in America. That's what they're for. They were to basically give scientific basis to this racism. That's where it comes from. And the idea of Planned Parenthood, we, we make sure we put you know, all kinds of uh, things, abort efficiency in the water supply. You know, we want to make sure that black people aren't breeding and we want to lobotomize and we want to sterilize. That was all part of this time period, uh, a huge part of it. That you, what they would have called eugenics, nobody calls it that now, but it would have been called eugenics then. Does that make sense for everyone? I'm so, I know this is depressing. I just want to... So, okay, if you guys are okay with this, I'm going to move on. And you can bring it back up, but I just I had to give you the kind of context of what was going on culturally around the world before we see why these Christian humanists matter and what they're reacting against. So, you guys read last week, The Wasteland. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And Peter, I'll get you in one second. But what I want you to recognize, and I, I think Dietra probably told you this, and we'll come back to it here today as well as on, on Thursday, but the wasteland is a mocking of these ideas. Right? The wasteland, as Eliot is putting it, he's taking the very form of modernity, and you've only read it through the once, but if you notice and you listen to Eliot read, plus you had the woman in there reading as well, everything's compartmentalized into these parts. Here's a story, here's a story, here's a story, here's a story. Eliot is intentionally, he's a genius at this, he is intentionally taking the concept of modernity and writing his poetry based on that concept. But then he turns it around because all the morality that's within each of those compartments is undermining progressivism and it's undermining modernity. So he uses the form of modernity to attack modernity. That's, that's Eliot's true genius. And that's one reason he's so accepted by people who would despise his views. But because he's writing in that fashion, all these people who are experimenting with new ideas and they're always playing with things like time and rhythm, uh, you'll see that constantly. If you think about atonalism, if any of you studied the history of music, all of it in literature, they're always trying to figure out how do we compartmentalize and then at what point do we allow that to become our morality? And Eliot is giving us an image here in the wasteland very intentionally. Look what you've created. In your dehumanizing program, you've created the wasteland. It's 1922. We just saw the hell of World War I. We've seen what progressivism does from Eliot's perspective. It rips us apart. Heart. It destroys us, and it gives us nothing upon which to build. And that's why, and Eliot, and I hope you guys caught this at the end, this is why at the end, and he, he's speaking in, in Sanskrit, where he's doing the da da doom, and you get that the, the sound of the thunder, but it's also a very Christian, as well as extremely Hindu, but it's a very Christian image of the possibility of redemption through baptism, because water's coming. So the wasteland may be nourished in some way. There may be redemption, but maybe not either. And that, that's part of what the wasteland is trying to do. But it is truly saying, and Eliot is, you know, do you guys, we haven't talked much about Eliot, and I wanted, we're going to talk a lot about him this semester, but this is a guy who completed his dissertation in philosophy at Harvard. Right? This is not... He, went, he was a, a PhD candidate at Harvard and earned his degree there when Harvard was the single finest institution of philosophy anywhere in the world, better than Oxford at that point. <clears throat> so Eliot's not just some guy who got lucky in terms of being published in the right spots, the right places. This guy put his time in, and he was deeply brilliant. Now, he never accepted. It's very interesting. He, on the books, is a PhD from Harvard but he refused to go back to Harvard and accept the uh, award. So his whole life, he never, ever signed his name with a PhD and never acknowledged it beyond the fact that he allowed his dissertation to be published about a year before he died. Uh, that was it. But because he thought it was irre irrelevant. Now, why did I spend this time chasing this? Can you imagine you get a philosophy degree from the greatest school in the world and you don't accept it, even though you've done everything to earn it, but you never signed the dotted line? 
and therefore, I mean, that, that's incredible. So I, my point is this, Elliot not only is fluent in a thousand different languages, I'm exaggerating, but he, he knows, I mean, he, is, he can read Chinese, he can read ancient Hindu, I mean, he, this guy is, he's incredible in what he's trying to do, but he knows Darwin and Marx, these are his enemies. I think he is directly going against these people. He's going against Freud. That whole scene that you have in the wasteland where you've got the couple talking to each other it is straight out of Freud. He's mocking it to no end. And the same thing, he can't stand Nietzsche. Right? And, and they're, they're basically, uh, Nietzsche's two generations older than Eliot, but they're contemporaries for the most part. And Spencer, of course, and Ross. You know, these are the kinds of people that he is directly going against. So the Wasteland, in 1922, and I'll bring the original in. Uh, it's incredible to look at the original versus what we have. But the Wasteland is Eliot's reaction against modernity. And if you want to think of it this way, and in fact, not just if you want to, I'm going to demand that you do. Uh, one of the best ways to understand what Eliot is doing in his poetry is this. He writes The Wasteland, and The Wasteland is hell. And he loves Dante, <laughs> Eliot is a huge Dante scholar in all kinds of, and he loves Virgil, he loves Dante. So, the wasteland is hell. When we get to Ash Wednesday and the Hollow Men, we're in purgatory. And when we get to the four quartets, we're in heaven. That, that is not, that's not just conjecture. This is how Eliot wrote it. He is intentionally placing these three things, and his poetry develops out of that. Now, he himself will not actually convert to Christianity, interestingly enough, until 1926, and won't announce it to the public until 1927. So The Wasteland is written when Eliot has rejected his Christianity, and yet it still has those deeply Christian elements, but it also has Hindu elements, uh, and some Confucian elements too. But it, it is a, a very serious Christian poem without necessarily Eliot meaning it to be. So we'll come back to that, and we're going to spend some time with the wasteland, but I do want you to understand that. So the wasteland, for our purposes, is three things. It is, number one, an attack on modernity. It's, number two, hell. And number three, something we haven't talked about, is it's also Eliot's deep desire to bring back Camelot. It's an Arthurian moment. So he has to find the Chapel Perilous right, for the Arthurian legend. We'll talk more about that, but for now, as long as you understand that Eliot is deeply Arthurian, that's really important. Anybody know where Eliot's from? Yeah, Lauren. Is he English? No, he's not. That is a good guess. He converts... He, he actually takes English citizenship, and he renounces his former citizenship. So, Connor? I mean, I'm pretty sure he's American, but where exactly, I don't know. Because I, if I remember right, T.S. Eliot is American, but becomes British, and W. Jordan is British, but becomes American. <laughs> yep. Anyone want to take a guess where he's from? How about this? Uh, if you guys have your book, very, 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 very briefly, look at this. We go to the four quartets. And we look at uh, one of my favorite favorite lines on page 130 at the Dry Salvages, right at the top. I do not know much about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god. Does that, does that help? Where's he from? Andrew. Is it Cape Ann, Massachusetts? <laughs> That's where his family is from. He grew up in St. Louis, right next to the Mississippi. He's just south of Mark Twain, where he grew up. So I have to admit, this is just a, a moment of autobiography, and Nathaniel was with me. I went to St. Louis basically to see T.S. Eliot's house. And I didn't know it was at the time. I had just, I had read, okay, so I have to, Again, another piece of autobiography. I've had this book right here, my the same one you guys have. 
I have had it since high school. I had to, for my senior year of high school, I had to recite the Hollow Men to graduate public school, you know, but we still, and so I fell in love with Elliot my senior year of high school, and this book has stayed with me, along with my New English Bible. It's only two books of original ones that I've kept since then. Everything else I have, my Lord of the Rings, they're all newer copies, mostly because I lent out, stupidly, my original copies. <laughs> but these, uh, this has been with me, and it has always given me, I, this book, it's given me so much strength through so many things, and I keep it next to my, my nightstand. It's on my nightstand next to my bed, generally. But anyway... This, uh, I, I wanted Elliot, and I fully admit this is my own bias. When we went to Elliot's boyhood home, which we did in St. Louis, I wanted it to be a shack. I wanted Elliot to have been raised in poverty and to have gotten out of that. Elliot's uncle was the president of Harvard. His other uncle was the founder of a college in St. Louis. His house, which we drove up to, which I thought would be this little shack, was a four-story brick mansion. Wow. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. This guy came from total money. <laughs> like old American money. But he renounced his U.S. citizenship for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is very funny, because he doesn't die till 1965. But his number one reason for renouncing American citizenship, that Andrew Jackson became president. I'm not joking. If we could go from John Quincy Adams to Andrew Jackson, it meant we didn't have a real country. That was his, his view. I mean, these guys are very interesting. He also was convinced that in 1898, Western civilization went into a dark age that we're still not out of. And he didn't say why 19, or 1898. But. Peter, well, that was my question. you were going to ask something earlier, though. Oh, that's, that was just a passing thought. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I should that's have gotten you right away. Okay. All right, so I want to mention two other people right now, three other people, just to give you a bit of background about where Elliot is coming from. So there are three figures for this class that I want you to know and we'll keep talking about over the next couple of classes as we get into Elliot. One is Irving Babbitt. Irving Babbitt is identified with Harvard. His best friend, whom I read to you, from whom I read to you uh, two weeks ago, his deathbed autobiography was Paul Elmer Moore. These guys are as tight as they come. And they meet each other when they're in grad school, right out of college. They're about the same age, a little bit different in age, but almost the same age. And their correspondence is one of the healthiest correspondences I think any scholar could ever hope for beautiful letters throughout their whole career, going back and forth to one another. I mentioned to you that even as best friends, they never, ever referred to each other as Paul or Irving. It was always Mr. Moore and Mr. Babbitt. They also did not believe, even though they had earned it like Elliot, and Elliot probably got his belief, they did not believe that the PhD was a legitimate thing. And so that's why they always made their students call them Mr., not Dr., and they just thought it was a made-up institution that the Germans had created to infiltrate good Anglo-Saxon culture. So <laughs> they refused to accept it. Remember, neither Lewis nor Tolkien had a PhD either. They also refused. Uh, only an MA, so they're master, they're mister. Uh, interesting, interesting culture. So you've got Babbitt and Moore who are best friends. And uh, such good friends. It's amazing to go back and to read that correspondence how they went back on ideas and how they influenced one another the way that they were thinking and, and horrible moments too. So Paul Emmer Moore spends his professional teaching career at Princeton, Babbitt's at Harvard, and they always did everything they could to get their respective college to hire the other because they, they, there was nothing they wanted more than to be at the same college where they could get together daily and you know, have coffee, and uh, Babbitt, by the way, was a, a runner, like an outrageous runner, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, really a fitness freak long before that was a thing at all. Uh, so very interesting guys. And there was a, a moment where Paul Emmer Moore was visiting Oxford, and he was out in the countryside and decided to go for a hike out on a country tour and didn't get his mail for a month. And during that time, 
Harvard had a position open exactly in his field, and they got permission to hire, Babbitt got permission to hire Moore for it and to bring him to Harvard, and they had to fill the position before Moore got the letter. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get it. Uh, it's just so close how, how they come to one another, but they never, they never get it. Uh, they have to remain away from each other, which is very, very hard for them uh, their whole lives. But that correspondence, we wouldn't have that rich correspondence uh, without that friendship, but really amazing. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Babbitt. I always like to think of Babbitt as the Mark Kultoff of the last century. Uh, <laughs> Babbitt was from Dayton, Ohio, like Dr. Kultoff, and he was very tall and very, very muscular. Really, I mean, everybody always described him as just this incredibly fit kind of demigod everywhere he went. <laughs> and he would always carry this huge backpack where he had classics all the time and uh, would just pull a book out. And it would depend when he got to class that day which book he pulled out. If it was Plato, you got Plato that day. This is how he taught his courses. And he was very famous for this. He's T.S. Eliot's mentor. Uh, Eliot will love Babbitt. Babbitt's his undergraduate advisor. And they just they crave this. But I have to tell you a little bit more about Babbitt. So Babbitt's family, so now we're not like the Kultoffs. Babbitt's family was very deeply divided and broken within itself. We know almost nothing about Babbitt's mother. And we know that Babbitt's father was a con man. So he used to, his big thing, he would write these books that we would now call New Age Philosophy. But he would write these books on the properties of crystals, and he would sell. He would go around, and he would sell you crystals. And these crystals, he said, would determine the sex of your baby. So it, the moment you get pregnant, if you place a crystal on, uh, if a woman would, on her womb, on her belly, that would determine what the sex is. So you could either buy a boy or a girl crystal. I mean, this is nutty. <laughs> You guys should all know that, right? That's really nutty. Don't buy crystals for this stuff. I mean, maybe you shouldn't buy crystals at all, but definitely not, not to change the sex of your baby. So Babbitt was not raised by his father. His dad didn't really want anything to do with him, and he was then farmed out to other families. And so he would be like a foster kid. He just went from home to home to home. But he was a genius. He was absolutely brilliant and restless. So the moment he's no longer under the authority of any parents, he wants to do two things that are just very important to him. Number one, he's really fascinated by all these immigrants in New York. He wants to see what they really live like. So he joins a gang. He goes to New York and he joins an ethnic gang, a gang where they're out beating up people, beating up other gangs, getting into brawls. He finds he doesn't like it that well, even though he's good at it. I just realize this is not, not what he wants to do. So he catches a train out to Wyoming, and he joins a ranch. And he loves ranch life. Now, can you just imagine this 17, 18-year-old who's now gone and joined a gang, was successful at it, decided to go do something else, so he goes out and he ranches. And now he's learning how to cow herd. He's learning how to be a cowboy. And his favorite thing, this guy, he loved rattlesnake hunting. That was his hobby. And so he became an expert where he would find rattlesnake holes and he would stick his hand in and grab the rattlesnake by right here under the head. And then he would whip them to break their backs across. And that was his, his hobby, killing rattlesnakes. What a guy. <laughs> After this, he decides he's going to go to Paris. And he goes to Paris to study. And one of my favorite moments, so I told you a moment ago, he's a fitness freak. And I mean that in the best sense. But nobody was a fitness freak in 1900. This is really, really weird. And he was obsessed with running, just ran all the time. And there was one night he was working on his dissertation, and he was really restless, and it was midnight, and he was in Paris. So he put his tennis shoes on, and he went for a run. And the Paris police thought he was a thief. And as it turned out, they chased him throughout all of downtown Paris for about two hours. And he had no idea he was being chased. He just kept running. And they finally caught up to him, and he explained to them, I'm just out for a run. And they thought, crazy American. 
But, you know, this was really unusual. Now, this doesn't end. When he goes to Harvard, he will only have office hours if you go running with him or if you go walking when he got older. So he, everybody would know it's 1 to 3, three o'clock, Babbitt's having office hours, but you would have to run with him. And that's how he had his office hours, his whole career, until he couldn't run and then he walked and you still had to walk with him. But these are, these are great men. <laughs> totally weird. But we just don't produce people like this anymore. So he gets his degree in classics and he wants nothing more than to be a classics professor. And he is fluent in Greek and Latin and Sanskrit and he is fluent in the various forms of Mandarin. He wants a classics position. And the classics department at Harvard says no. He's too arrogant. He's too full of himself. But the French department needed somebody. So the French department hired him. And of course, he'd lived in Paris. He was also fluent in French. But he resented it all his life. He used to go out, even though he, had this, he was a, a tenured faculty member at Harvard, he used to say, and I, I don't know if I can find the quote right now, but he used to walk out in the hall to be as loud as he could in the French department. And he would say, uh, I don't know if I have it here. He would say, uh, I have no idea how I ended up in French. It's a second-rate language for a second-rate people. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me get this, if I can get this exactly right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to find it right. Oh, no, yes. He would go out with the, his colleagues in the French department, and especially to the chairman of the department, and tell him that French was a second-rate language for second-rate people. It was a cheap and nasty substitute for a real language, being Latin. <laughs> so there he is, right? But he never, he never got that classics position. But here, okay, one student describes what his classes were like. He would come in with his book bag, bursting, and he would take out notes, and then he would start arranging his notes and whatever books came out in front of him. He'd then begin to sway in his chair, and then suddenly he would leap out of the chair, and he would pour forth a barrage of criticism upon some doctrine or some line of poetry. Now, remember, this is French. <laughs> right? So you would think if you sign up to take a French class, you're going to speak French, and you're going to study French literature. No. He may bring out the writings of the Buddha, or Aristotle, or Plato, or Horace, or Dante, or Milton, and he would deluge you with the wisdom that he had. His thoughts were unpacked, and they poured out so fast you could never keep up with them. You didn't know what he was talking about half the time, but you felt that he was in so much earnestness that it must be the most important thing ever said, and that sometime it would count, even if you didn't understand it until later. He was uttering things dogmatically that would cut straight into your beliefs. He was disposed derisively of what you adored, and he would drive you and force you into reconstruction of your entire system of thought. One day, he would batter you down. The next day, he would knock you out. And the day after that, he would build you up. You never felt for a moment, however, that he was merely a teacher and you were merely his pupil. You felt that he was Coleridge, or Carlyle, or perhaps Buddha, pouring forth the full-stuffed cornucopia of all the knowledge that the world had ever known upon your head. And you were no longer in class. You were a man, and you were seeking through literature to understand what life itself was about. You were dealing with questions that were bigger than nations and civilizations. He himself seemed to know the right answer and was building a thoroughfare of ideas from the Greeks to the present. You went out of that room so laden down with ideas, but you knew they were each tremendously important. He related for you a multitude of separate and apparently disconnected thoughts, but suddenly they would become central as a current of thought and a thread. But you were always carried away with a sense and a need of the immense learning, and you realized that this class was not about literature. It was about life, and it would take the rest of your life to verify what you had just learned. It's great. Right? Who doesn't want to be transformed like that in a classroom? And this is Babbitt. And Babbitt did this in every way. 
right? Wherever he was, he was just this force. So we don't understand this in this day and age because we've got this celebrity culture. But it's very interesting to go back and to look at Babbitt. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of this. If you ever get a chance, there's a, a thing on Google called Google Ngram. N as in the letter N. So it's just N gram. And you can put in, and I highly recommend it for research, what it does is it collates everything that Google has scanned or categorized, every book, every article, every newspaper article, and you can track the influence of a person. And during the 1920s, and I'm not going to get this exactly right because I, I did this a year and a half ago. I have to go back and look. But it was something like 27% of all American publications referenced Babbitt at least once during the 1920s. That, that's huge. Right? I, I went back and did the same thing for Russell Kirk in his day and age, and it was only something like 1% or 2%. So we're talking about people here who made huge differences in the world, and no matter what, even if you didn't agree with Babbitt or more, you read him. Every American read him. Everybody. Uh, anybody in here know, if some of you might have, with me in American Heritage, you might remember, there's a very famous, she was the most famous woman journalist of her day, a woman named Dorothy Thompson. She's the one, she's the first person Hitler kicked out of Germany. She was an American, but she was writing article against uh, him <laughs> over and over again for the New York Herald Tribune, International Herald Tribune. And so Hitler got a law passed to have her removed. And she came back to America, but she was, her first husband, she had two marriages. Her first husband was to Sinclair Lewis. And one time, and very famously, she was giving birth. And as she was waiting for the baby to come, she was in the hospital. She was waiting for the baby to come. She had picked up, and we don't know, it was either a book by Mabbitt, Babbitt or Moore. We don't know which. And right as birth, as labor started, she took the book and threw it against the wall and said, I hate the humanists so much, I'd much rather give birth to a baby than ever read another one of their books. Now, that's a great moment. But it's a great moment that tells us about the power of these guys. They were deeply influential. And even if we only remembered them for being the teachers of T.S. Eliot, that would be enough. But they're more than that. They're so much more than that. Okay, any, any final questions? Not, if not, I'm going to pick this back up on Thursday. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, sorry I had you bring your, your book, but do bring it. Uh, from now on, try and bring it, and we're going to get back into the wasteland and talk a little bit about it.